Yeah, Benny, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me and also to David. And uh, yeah, it's great to be here as I yeah, finished Epoch just three years ago. Um, so it's really an honor to, to present here. And well, before doing so, just a question in the room. Um, who of you has heard of export credit agencies before seeing the announcement of this seminar? You can just maybe raise your hands. Nobody? Nobody? Really? Well, it's to me, it's not that surprising because when we started to work on that topic back in 2020, it was pretty much a black box for us as well. And before I had worked uh, about one year on multilateral development banks, which especially in the context of climate, many uh, people work on more uh, closely or in the context of uh, well, public finance institutions, but export credit agencies, uh, not really there. There was, it's a very, it's a, it was a very under-researched topic. Um, and so, well, we started uh, back then with a very small study on it in, in 2020. And today we're um, uh, yeah, a team of five people uh, that, that are working on it, um, funded by a major uh, European uh, foundation. And um, yeah, just a disclaimer about this presentation. So it's going to be more policy focused. Um, I'm not going to draw a lot on theory, but rather on, yeah, on, on policy and on, on ECS themselves about the export finance system. And I hope it's of interest to you. Before starting the presentation, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, perspectives. So that's my former um, employer. I'm now a research associate with them. Um, so about perspectives, that's a, an international consultancy company um, with about 50 employees uh, headquartered in Germany, in Freiburg. Um, but basically, especially since COVID, most of the employees work uh, well, from all across Europe. And um, well, Perspectives works on a, on a wide range of topics, uh, including climate finance, uh, carbon markets, uh, CCS, hydrogen, and uh, also negotiation support at the UNEP CCC. So at all the COPs, uh, Perspectives supports official delegations uh, um, well, to, to the COP uh, on, yeah, on a variety of, of topics. And one particularity of Perspectives work is that many of the staff members are affiliated with universities. So for instance, Axel Mikhailova, our founder, um, he, yeah, he's at the University of Zurich. Uh, my colleague Iro Shishlov, with whom I'm also doing this project, he's here in Paris at HEC Paris. And I myself, I started a PhD now at uh, HEC Lausanne in Switzerland. So there, and there are many other colleagues that have uh, some sort of university affiliation. We kind of work between that research and consultancy space. And I'm saying this because it might be interesting for some of you as well yes there's a question a bit louder yes I'll, then i'll drink something and then i will i will do my best <laughs> so that's the agenda for today um, i'm going to start with aligning finance uh, with the paris agreement so what does that mean um, then I'm going to talk about the case of export credit agencies, so what they are, um, what they, what ECAs uh, do. Um, I'm going to present to you then the Paris alignment methodology that we developed in Perspectives, um, which we basically use to assess whether an ECA and uh, its, its guardian authority, the government, um, whether their operations are in line with the Paris Agreement or not, so the 1.5 degree Celsius goal. Um, and then I'm going to talk about briefly about uh, some of our case studies um, later in the respondent presentation will will yeah, have a deep dive on, on one of the case studies on Canada. Um, and then I'll end just by talking about some well systemic reform opportunities and and an outlook. <clears throat> So, um, so what does it mean to align finance flows with uh, one with 1.5 degrees? Um, we should actually speak about uh, what we can do to increase the probability of uh, staying below uh, 1.5 degrees um, of global warming compared to pre-industrial levels. And well, there are there are a couple of perspectives that one can take. Um, one important one is that we sh that we um, shouldn't emit more than 500 uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide until two, uh, 2100 so this is the this is the yeah current carbon budget as we call it uh, that we still have that we have still left until the end of this century and just to put that into context that's about as much as the world emitted between 2010 
and today. So this is basically what we have left for the next uh, 87 years. And this is the, 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 the big challenge ahead. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, um, uh, yeah, another way of putting it is we need to have emissions um, before uh, 2030 and go net zero by by 2050 and go really gen for, for genuine net zero. There are many uh, definitions of that out there, but I yeah recommend you to have a look at the at the IPCC uh, report. Um, and another way of putting it more from the production side is, and there's a great uh, UCL study from University College London out there, um, is looking at the, at the supply of fossil fuels. And well, they showed that to stick within 1.5 degrees, what really needs to happen, uh, we need to leave 60% of today's proven oil and uh, gas reserves in the ground and nearly 90% of, of proven coal reserves. Um, and this is really something that before hasn't been so present in the in the discussion. Also, the whole UNFCCC process typically dealt with emissions um, rather than with uh, well the, the the production side of fossil fuels. Um, and um, yeah, well, we, we promote this study because it's really we, we think it should be a game changer in how we we think about climate policy. Um, then also the IEA that is uh, yeah known to be more on the conservative side of things because it's yeah uh, not the least uh, uh, an intergovernmental organization where nearly all governments uh, take part in, but even the IEA since 2021 say that uh, no new um, fossil fuel supply infrastructure need, uh, yeah, can be developed to stay uh, within uh, net zero and they yeah build a scenario on top of it. We'll come we'll come to that a bit later. Um, but they even reiterated that uh, against uh, the, the war in Ukraine and the ensuing energy crisis. <clears throat> so um, in our view, what is the most important thing to uh, aligning finance flows with uh, 1.5 degrees is to first of all identify misaligned economic activities and withdraw both private and public finance uh, from them. Uh, whilst ensuring a just transition and then also identify Paris aligned and sustainable activities and redirect financial flows and the latter has really in the last decade um, been the focus of the attention uh, many uh, financial actors uh, governments in academia yeah we talk about climate finance we talk about sustainable finance but um, the yeah uh, a few people talk about um, these misaligned, unsustainable um, activities, which are currently still the bulk of where finance flows go. Um, and so what we really need to do is we need to avoid building a green economy on top of a brown one and calling it a success, which is what's yeah, happening, um, unfortunately, too, too often uh, at international conferences or in the, yeah, in the annual reports of financial organizations. Um, so here's just uh, uh, some scenarios from the International Energy Agency. So on the left, you see the steps, the stated policy scenario. In the middle, this is the APS. This is the announced pledges scenario. And on the right, you see the net zero emissions by 2050 scenario. And so the steps is basically um, the IA will put into their model all the all the stated policies, so where governments not only uh, committed to something, announced a pledge, but really they 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 introduced the policy. It's 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 implemented, um, and you see. So this is the the the, the global total energy supply um, between 2020 and 2050, and you see that here, yeah, uh, roughly 500 exajoules still come from fossil fuels in the in the stated policy scenario. If you look at the announced pledges, so this includes uh, NDCs, so nationally determined contributions, um, for instance, or other pledges. Um, yeah, it really, it really go like the fossil fuel share really goes down, um, but far too slow. And so, what what the IEA uh, projects in the net zero scenario is basically a rapid decrease until 2030 of the share of fossil fuel um, uh, 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 fossil fuels in the in total energy supply. So that includes primary energy, is not only electricity. Um, and this needs to this needs to be less than uh, non fossil energy supply by yeah just after 2030 um so this is a, this is a huge challenge 
And that's why I want to talk about a bit about the barriers uh, of aligning finance flows with 1.5 degrees very broadly speaking, not in the context of ECAs now, but very broadly. And there, um, the first thing is really the, the, the sheer scale of, of finance that is still going into fossil fuels, uh, which is way bigger than um, financial support for mitigation or, or adaptation activities. Um, the last year has seen, at least in global debt markets, a slight change uh, as debt that was raised for fossil-related energy projects was uh, smaller for the first time than for um, uh, green projects, according to the Bloomberg definition. Um, but there are many other sources of financing for um, the fossil fuel industry, which make that assessment, um, yeah, which, which, which gives it a, a major caveat. Um, then the second... Uh, main barrier that I want to talk about is the, the overabundance uh, of fossil fuel supply and also the continued profitability of being active in, in fossil fuel value chains. So, uh, yeah, just if we just look at oil and gas, for instance, there are still more than 55,000 um, projects out there for which uh, an official exploration permit exists. So this is where a government basically authorizes the exploration of a, well, of an offshore or onshore gas uh, supply or an oil field, um, but for which no final investment decision has been has been taken yet. So those actors that are exploring these oil and gas fields, they, they don't have a they don't have investors on board. They haven't finally decided they will actually de develop this field. So there are 55,000 such, uh, such projects out there, which is massive. And um, in line with the net zero scenario by the International Energy Agency, none of them should be developed. And um, the problem is that still many of these uh, projects will probably be developed um, because of, well, we have very strong lobbies in the fossil fuel industry. There are many legal barriers also for, um, for governments to uh, enforce their climate policy, for instance, multilateral investment treaties. Um, so these are treaties between countries that will give investment uh, protection over 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and they, well, to a significant extent, um, uh, shield yeah, investments from, from, well, the effects of, of climate policy. And then also, as we see now also in Europe, the unfettered profitability of satisfying energy demands. So maybe you've heard of that, uh, that may, yeah, many energy companies right now uh, make very significant profits from the, from the scarcity of, of fossil fuels because of the lack of Russian oil and gas, um, especially in, in, in Europe. And yeah, it's a political, a big political struggle to uh, to get to agree on uh, an excess uh, tax and pro an uh, excess profit tax. Uh, yeah. So, and then yeah, you all know that um, well, one major barrier, especially in the last two or three years, for international climate policy was just a very, very, very tense geopolitical world very fragmented and um, the short-term crisis management priorities that many governments have and thereby lose really their capacity um, in terms of personal, in terms of financial resources in many, in many dimensions to, to actually work on climate. <clears throat> and just to yeah, speak about some uh, solutions at that very high level. So uh, globally, we really need to uh, restrict fossil fuel production and that both at the domestic level, but also at the, at the export level. Um, and just produce as much as it as it's yeah still compatible with 1.5 degrees, which, as you yeah as as you know is uh, is really very little. Uh, we have very little a, a very small carbon budget left, and um, expand massively expand renewable energy and uh, related infrastructure, um, uh, and reduce energy demand. And the letter I, I put in bold because it's really on the international agenda. It's really. Um, not very high. Um, so often there's this idea of, okay, we, we keep our energy demand and we just substitute fossil fuels by renewables, but that poses a whole nother set of problems. And especially for the global north and for economic elites. Um, uh, yeah, we really need to explore pathways, how to reduce energy demand and also bring those pathways into the IPCC reports, um, uh, which uh, yeah, is, 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 is only to, to, in a, to a very small extent considered. And just yeah, one one last uh, outlook on the restriction of fossil fuel supply in the future. So one uh, very notable initiative in the last uh, year is the 
Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, maybe you've heard of this. Um, so far, no country has signed on it, but uh, yeah, many municipalities and big cities in the world already. And they basically, they call for a new international treaty um, that yeah, fossil fuel supply doesn't proliferate um, exactly in, in line with the, yeah, with the uh, studies and arguments that I've just, that I've just put. <clears throat> So then now about the role of finance in the Paris Agreement. So there are actually yeah, several sections where the Paris Agreement speaks about uh, finance. So there's the Article 9, uh, for instance, which is about the provision of climate finance. So this is uh, financial support from the global north to the global south um, through climate finance. And yeah, this is uh, this needs to be understood in, yeah, against the context of historical responsibility of countries in the global north vis-a-vis -vis the global south to support uh, countries in the south that are more affected by climate change, uh, both to mitigate, um, but also to adapt to the, to the impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm. And maybe you have heard about the um, 100 uh, billion uh, US dollars per year goal that was agreed on in, 20, in, in 2009 in Copenhagen. Um, um, so this is basically the pledge that, that the Global North has made to support countries in the Global South with these adaptation and mitigation efforts, and that it has, uh, yeah, up until, to, uh, up until today actually not been met, um, not even according to the uh, definition of the OECD, which includes both uh, loans, um, but also grants. So there's a big discussion whether this should be a net transfer or whether also concessional loans can also be part of that, of that goal. Um, yeah, so in the context of our studies and of our work, um, uh, yeah, we basically refer to the Article 2.1c, um, which is a more general uh, article talking about uh, finance. So it, it basically says that, um, yeah, those countries that sign the Paris Agreement should make efforts to uh, make finance flows consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. So it's, it's, it's relatively broad, but this is, this is basically where, well, if we speak about the whole financial system and its alignment with the Paris Agreement, this is what we refer to. And I yeah, just uh, sketched here both the public finance and the private si finance side. So public finance, we, well, we have state-owned enterprises, public finance institutions, um, investment treaties as an instrument, uh, domestic uh, investment flows, transboundary investment flows. And basically what I want to highlight here is that while well, public finance has a really, a really important uh, de-risking capacity, so it has the ability to steer, to steer pr uh, private finance flows, and ECAs play um, a really important part here, and that's yeah. We look at at public finance institutions um, that are internationally active, and so there are basically three types: there are multilateral development banks, there are bilateral development banks, and there are export credit agencies. And yeah, basically every early industrialized country has one, and now also industrializing countries and other emerging economies. Uh, well. They uh, create export credit agencies to become more competitive um, in the uh, yeah in the international economy, um, and this is the focus of today. So, what are they, um, and why are they relevant? Um, so, official ECAs they are either public or private agencies that have a, a mandate, so a government mandate uh, to promote national exports. That's basically um, yeah. That's basically true for pretty much every ECA around there. Um, and what they do is they provide loans, guarantees, um, and insurance schemes to national exporters or foreign buyers. And they cover yeah, about 14% of cross-border trade that was in 2021. And so that's about um, 2.7 trillion in new business uh, that was in, yeah, in 2021. And just to put that number into context, that's about 11 times um, of what MDBs uh, commit to in one year. So they are really, financially speaking, really, really significant. Um, and yeah, there is the Bernie Union. The Bernie Union is an umbrella association that, yeah, of export credit agencies, both the official ECAs, which is basically that means 
that it's, it belongs to a government or to a country, but also they're under the Bernie Union, they're both officially ECAs and private insurers. Um, they're both in the same. That's basically the, the global export finance system. But we basically look at official ECAs, so at government-backed ECAs, because they uh, yeah, uh, should, in principle, um, align their portfolio well, consistent with the government commitments on climate. And that's why we, uh, well, we, we see much stronger levers and also much stronger need for official ECAs um, to, to, uh, to align with the Paris Agreement because it was their government who in the first place signed it. Um, that's why we look at them. And they're also um, more risk-taking because they're basically official ECAs. So the government-backed ones, they're, they, it's not always the case, but in most cases, they have in their mandate um, something like uh, being the insurer of last resort. So that means basically they can only insure um, uh, the export of a, of a capital good, say a gas turbine, um, if there is no private insurer that would take this transaction. And, and many ECAs have in their, yeah, in their instructions uh, written, they have to demonstrate before that no private actor would actually take that transaction. And then only then um, the, um, the official ECA could, uh, could jump in and, and finance this project. <clears throat> And so in, in general, in terms of sectoral exposure, ECAs are very um, exposed to uh, uh, energy, natural resources, transport, and infrastructure. So really those sectors where yeah, there, there is simply a, a very high risk um, and that are also in terms of climate very, very relevant, but also in, in other terms and hum, uh, human rights, environment considerations. And in, yeah, in general, their portfolios represent yeah, fairly well the composition of the national export industry. So um, they've in the past done very little to steer, okay, where do exports go, um, at least from a climate perspective. In the past, ECAs have been really uh, important in, in steering exports more from a geostrategic, uh, political uh, point of view, um, but not really for climate. And yeah, we, what we basically, or why we started working on ECAs, because in, yeah, when we started to look at the, at the data, we realized that compared to um, development, so bilateral development banks or multilateral development banks, so this set of, of uh, PFIs um, is simply the, the, the largest class of G20 uh, public finance institutions supporting the, the fossil fuel energy sector. Um, and that's, that's why we started to work on them. And yeah, here you can see some, some data. So what we see here, basically, that's the, uh, the annual average of uh, support, financial support for the energy sector. So that can be loans, that can be guarantees or insurance products um, between 2017 and 2021. And yeah, we have here a selection of G20 countries and uh, this is only ECA support. And yeah, so on... On average, between these four years, uh, ECAs supported well fossil energy projects with about 40 billion US dollars, and that's yeah 11 times more than the support that they provided for renewable energy-related exports, and this is quite yeah quite quite stark. And we see that there is a strong concentration on Canada, on Japan, South Korea, and China, and that's why it's actually great that you selected Canada for the case study presentation later, so we can yeah uh, dive a bit deeper on that. Mm. So, uh, yeah, just to uh, just to clarify what here fossil fuels and uh, clean means. So fossil fuels basically includes, well, the oil, fossil gas, coal sectors and their entire life cycle. Um, so exploration, appraisal, development, extraction, uh, uh, preparation, transport, power, power plant, construction, operation, etc. PP. Um, so fossil fuel value chains are really very extensive and often when people talk about oil and gas, they only talk about upstream, but um, well, we have upstream value chains, we have midstream, we have downstream, so this is a very, very extensive field. Um, and yeah, also the definitions are unfortunately very inconsistent um, in the global landscape and many actors define it very, very differently. And you can also see here some of the countries have stars, uh, and this basically means that the data is very, very poor that we get from these countries. Um, so we, there's a big, uh, a big problem with the definitions and with the reporting, and a, 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 yeah, a strong lack of, of transparency, unfortunately. And just on the other side, clean 
basically means uh, yeah, low carbon forms of energy that have negligible impacts on the environment and human population. So in this, for instance, nuclear energy is, is not included um, and also large scale hydro is not included. Um, just to illustrate it a bit how ECAs work at the project level, I want to uh, provide yeah, one uh, project from the energy sector. So this is, I mean, ECAs also do a lot in, in other like mobility infrastructure, et cetera, PP. Um, but this is in the, in the energy sector. So this is an offshore LNG project in Mozambique. Uh, it's a giant multi-decade project that um, is currently under development in Cabo Delgado. In, in Mozambique uh, with about 1.8 trillion cubic meters of, of gas. So just to yeah, put that number into context, uh, that's about what Germany alone consumes in 23 years. So this project could uh, supply Germany for, for 23 years, which yeah, Germany is using about 80 billion cubic meters of gas every year. Um, being the largest consumer in the European Union, which has about 400, so you get an idea, uh, yeah, how how big this gas field is that, that we have that we talk about here in in Mozambique. Um, it's operated by the French energy company Total, and they have plans to deliver LNG as of 2024. And found in 2019, they arrived at an investment decision to uh, yeah of about 20 20 billion. Uh, which the, the entire, well, this is the entire uh, um, capital that was mobilized for funding this project. And so the financing here comes from uh, seven ECAs, 19 commercial banks and the African Development Bank. And yeah, this consists of direct loans, covered loans. So covered loans is basically if an ECA uh, provides a cover for, for one of the loans given by a commercial bank. And yeah, the countries that were involved from the ECA side, so that there was US exit, they provided, um, um, this is the American ECA, a 5 billion loan. There's, uh, well, from Japan, they even have two export credit agencies, JBIC and Nexi. Uh, UK export finance was involved, Italy, Sarche, South Africa, Thailand, and yes. the Dutch Atradius DSB. Um, and yeah. And then, uh, well, what happened actually then two years later was that Total Energy declared a force majeure because in the region, Cabo Delgado and Mozambique, well, there was an outbreak of violent conflict and there were Islamist terror attacks and it wasn't, uh, yeah, it's not that surprising as it was really not the first time um, in history that uh, violent conflict was associated with uh, the yeah, uh, discovery of fossil fuel reserves and extraction but there's no there's clearly like no there's there's no cause and link established between the two but it is plausible that there is a that there is an association especially if you yeah, are talking to the communities uh, that were displaced uh, through the project etc pp um, and yeah, the project is currently on hold but on the website total reports that um, yeah, as of 2024, they will actually deliver LNG, and they're counting on the military right now to uh, yeah, stabilize the region so that they can proceed with the um, with extracting LNG gas. So, yeah, I, I just want to also illustrate a bit so what specific project components are important there and how the financing through an ECA works so that you have an understanding what they what they actually do. So what, for instance, the Dutch ECA did um, in, or what their part in this project is because, you know, banks give a loan, but for specific project, for specific project components. And so in that case, um, it was about the service of a specialized dredging company. Uh, dredging is basically, that means to clear a seabed or anything underwater by, yeah, sucking out, well, what is on the, on the, on the, on the sea ground, scooping uh, the bottom of a river or of the sea. And so this is basically needed to install the infrastructure for, uh, yeah, so the off, uh, to, to extract the, the, the offshore gas and to transport it uh, to the onshore, onshore liquid, uh, liquefaction plant. And so the Dutch are the, yeah, internationally the leaders, the absolute leaders for this, providing these services. Uh, they export a lot of these technologies. So this is basically, they send dredging ships um, there and then they, they, they do this work. And so to do that, uh, Van Oort, so the dredging company, they applied at the Dutch government. Okay, Total requested us to provide the service. 
can you give us an insurance? And the Dutch said, yes, yes, we'll give you a 1 billion liability uh, 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 cover. So um, that in case something happens that an ord isn't paid, for instance, that they, that there's, for instance, a, a, re, a repayment default because, well, Total can't pay or there's an outbreak of violence, for instance, or any other, uh, yeah, unforeseen risk that uh, uh, would basically inhibit Total to pay Van Oort, then the Dutch government would step in and pay that money to, to the company. So this is basically um, this insurance that they, that they got from the Dutch state, and that's why they um, started to, to work on that project. And this is kind of this de-risking uh, capacity in, in practice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's also really interesting because that project for uh, in the UK triggered actually a court case. So in 2021, Friends of the Earth UK, they took uh, UK uh, to a court and um, basically said that, uh, well, financing this project in Mozambique would um, be, uh, well, at odds with its uh, obligations and commitments under the Paris Agreement. And then, well, in the first instance of that case, um, what happened was that there was a, uh, it was a very interesting case. There was a split decision. There was one judge uh, in the UK court saying um, that it's basically, it's lawful. It was lawful. And there was another judge who said um, that, yeah, the UK, uh, that UK have basically undermined its, its commitments under, under the Paris Agreement. And um, it was just until uh, last week, actually, that the, that, this, that the final decision was open. Now it's uh, sadly uh, come to a, uh, the end that it was deemed uh, a lawful decision by an appeal court and the judges what they say uh, is that the Paris Agreement is an unincorporated treaty which basically has no domestic uh, legal obligations um, yeah which yeah which which basically was the, the the end of the of the of the case I mean there might be a second round but for now this is uh, this this has unfortunately come to an end and yeah, just one of the key contention was um, the, the scope three emissions of this of this big gas project, which um, yeah initially were calculated with about uh, uh, yeah eight, eight eight million tons, and in the end it was a thousand times higher, which were like alternative estimates that were presented to the court, and that had initially yeah basically led to that split to that split decision. Um, so yeah, it, it was a very interesting interesting case because it was also one of the first times that an ECA was actually taken to a court um, for yeah for for supporting a, a certain project. And if you want to know more about that specific project, so last last year we organized a side event at COP26, and we invited uh, a representative from the from a farmers association in Cabo Delgado to give an intervention there. And he, well, he had a, he, there's a video of, of this event and you can, you can look at his, at his intervention to also get the perspective from the global south. <clears throat> yeah. Good. Um, just gonna. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, now I'm going to come to the Paris alignment methodology that we developed, and I see I have about fifteen minutes left. Um, yeah, it's ten, fifteen. Ten, fifteen. Okay, great. That works. No more than that. Yeah. Can... Yeah, yeah. That's that's good. Yeah. 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 So I'm yeah I'm going to walk you through the methodology that we developed uh, to assess ECAs. In their governments, so we basically have five dimensions: transparency, uh, which is about financial non-financial disclosure; mitigation one, which is about the ambition uh, of fossil fuel exclusion restriction policies; mitigation two, which is about the entire climate impact uh, and emission reduction targets of a, of an ECA, so measured in CO two if the data is available. Then we have a dimension on climate finance, so the, the, the proactive, the contribution of the ECA to the climate transition by financing, for instance, um, renewable energies. And we have an engagement dimension. So basically how um, proactive gov the governments and the ECA are uh, to yeah, change or to, to introduce climate related reforms. Um, and then for each dimension, we have between three and five uh, questions that we ask. And each of those questions are underpinned with four benchmarks. In total, we have 
18 questions and yeah, 72 benchmarks or criteria, if you want. Um, what they and they basically define what we mean by by Paris alignment in all of these dimensions. And very importantly, and also in contrast to other methodologies like from the Paris Alignment Working Group at MDB, so E3G, the think tank, what we do, we apply a weight. So we basically um, had an expert based um, yeah, determination of these weights. So we invited like 20, 20 30 people uh, that are very knowledgeable in the field to give us their idea which dimension should be weighted uh, how strongly. And that's why we weigh the mitigation component with 60%. And the rest was uh, yeah was with was yeah less strongly, and we also don't talk about adaptation in our methodology for now, because we wanted really to we want really to focus on on mitigation on bringing bringing emission or finance ensured emissions down and especially excluding fossil fuel uh, projects, and yeah this is just just briefly how it works. So at the end basically. Uh, what we do is an evidence-based expert judgment, and then we assign one of these numbers that will aggregate to the final score of, a, of an ECA that you can see here at the, the bottom right. Um, and this is just an example question. So to what extent can the share of fossil fuel finance over the total portfolio be assessed? And then we have different, uh, yeah, different criteria, how that works. But you can have a look at that in the, in the annex of our methodology document. And that's the assessment boundary. So we basically look at the government at the policies and at the portfolio of the ECA. Um, yeah. And the data that we use is well, the annual reports by ECAs uh, or data repositories where they are available. Um, and yeah, mostly the government communications or commitments that they publish. For instance, if they give a, a speech at a conference or um, some else press releases. And then we do one interview with the ECA and the government. And uh, there are also several third party providers that, that are quite important. And so basically what, what our role of perspective is, and I think that's quite quite important, is that we're not an, we're not an NGO, we're a consultancy firm or a research firm. And so there are several NGOs also working on the topic. And what we do at conferences, well, we, what, what we try to do is to mediate between NGOs, between research and between governments. So we often organize policy dialogues um, at the OECD or at the COP conferences. Um, and we try to bring basically NGOs or project developers, exporters, research in conversation with governments that then mandate or change the legislation for, for their respective ECAs. And yeah, we did so far six case studies. Uh, we worked on Germany, on Japan, on the Netherlands, on Canada, uh, on the UK and on the US. And so far only the UK scored some progress according to our methodology. And there's yeah, three more case studies just in the pipeline. So we'll soon publish the one actually on Italy and then on France and South Korea. And now just a few words about um, yeah, more uh, well, systemic reform opportunities. So there's the OECD arrangement, which in the field of export finance, it's the, um, yeah, the most significant uh, supranational policy framework that basically defines terms and conditions for um, yeah, key sectors in, in export finance. And it's with the OECD trade directory, not with the WTO, which is an interesting historical uh, fact. And what the objective of that is that it's supposed to achieve a level playing field. So basically fair competition between countries that have ECAs. And yeah, so it was, so the, the OECD arrangement was basically created for this fair competition in strategic sectors when also during the, the, the Cold War, um, but when it was really about strategically competing in sectors like shipbuilding, power plants, aircraft, rail, and telecommunications. So these were the sectors that initially were covered by the, by the OECD arrangement. And yeah, so the, the participants in this club, um, it's, it's not all OECD countries, actually. The participants are, um, yeah, most OECD countries, uh, exactly, but not all of them. Um, yeah, I think there's not a non-OECD country in here. But yeah, you see too, Australia, Canada, EU, Japan, South Korea, New Zealand, Norway, Switzerland, Turkey, UK, and United States, but for instance, not uh, Colombia. <clears throat> 
And yeah, there are several climate related reforms that were introduced uh, already to the arrangement. It's still very slim on climate. So in 2005, there was a, also a sector understanding on renewable energy related exports. Um, in 2015, there was a sector understanding that was technology based on coal fired electricity generation. So basically, prescribing to, sub, to provide ex, official export financing for um, uh, uh, highly pollute, polluting coal plants. And then in 2021, um, there was the first time that in the, in the OECD arrangement, there was introduced a prohibition clause so that it was actually used as a um, kind of as a policy to prohibit something. And the participants could actually agree on uh, stopping any official support for coal-fired electricity generation. And yeah, so this was a, this was a, a kind of a, a leap uh, in the climate history of the arrangement, but still far from being enough because it's only about coal-fired electricity generation and not about the other elements of coal, of the coal value chains, like coal mining, coal transport, et cetera, PP. And also, and that's uh, probably more significant e even, is that there are no restrictions at all on oil and gas financing and all the yeah, related infrastructure to, to oil and gas. Um, yeah, so this I'll keep relatively uh, slim. It's basically I found, well, I found this, uh, this cover photo here of the Global Export Credit uh, Competition Report of the US Exxon Bank quite telling and quite symbolical because it's, it really represents a bit uh, uh, the type of mindset that there is in, in, uh, in global export finance is really this highly competitive nature, China first, and then comes okay, other countries, France, US, Canada, further down, and uh, yeah, and we're all climbing a mountain. But there is, yeah, so, so export finance, it's an extremely competitive uh, realm, especially in these, in these sectors. Um, and yeah, so basically one fear that we often perceive uh, that governments or ECAs tell us is that, okay, if we would now stop uh, supporting fossil fuels, then other countries would step in and get these hard fought for market shares um, and basically finance it with, with maybe environmental standards that are less than those that we apply. And that's why countries are hesitant to go out of, of, out of fossil fuels. And this is really, this goes back to this extremely competitive idea of okay how we set up our international economy and um, yeah in our view we really need to get to more uh, uh, cooperation in well in, in in export finance also in other fields but also in, uh, and especially in export finance because there for instance we really still have this these we have two blocks basically we have OECD arrangement participants that exclude or this is basically the western worlds and then there is there are the big players which are India China, Indonesia, and some other uh, BRICs that are not part of the arrangement. And there's, there was, there used to be a working group on that, the International Working Group on, on Export Credits, but they suspended the activity in 2020 because they couldn't, uh, well, they got stuck on, 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 on terms and conditions. And since then, they're not talking anymore. And um, yeah, we really, so what we do in our, in our work, we call to redefine the mandates of ECAs in the 21st century and yeah, make them more purpose-driven, simply put. And yeah, there's a bit of momentum now since two years in the export finance system. So the most notable thing is probably the COP26 statement on the clean energy transition where yeah, uh, about 20 countries and some financial institutions agreed on principles to end international support for unabated uh, fossil fuels by the end of last year. So by now, yeah, um, um, most countries or some countries already have uh, actually implemented this policies and released policies to not support fossil fuels anymore. Um, yeah, but other countries also now in the context of the war have even backslided on their commitments, including Germany, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, and, and yes, also the big players, like as you saw on the graph, like China or in South Korea and Japan didn't sign onto the COP26 statement. Canada did, but for Canada, the problem is that most of their support is at the domestic level. This is a, it's a petrol and gas exporting country, so international support is not so significant for them. So that's why they could relatively easily sign on the COP26 statement. Um, but they're at least on it. And there's also now the in Europe we have the Export uh, Finance for Future initiative, and they yeah this is a set of of 10 European countries, and they also agreed on principles to align with 1.5 degrees, which is a 
it's a it's a step forward. It's a very good step forward, and they have an, an excellent uh, actually reporting framework now that takes into account some of the recommendations that we also gave to to ECAs in our report. So this is a, this is this is really like transparency wise uh, a good a good step forward. And this is my last uh, slide. So yeah, some obstacles to aligning export finance with 1.5 degrees. So this is this uh, perceived risk or fear of well, seizing market shares to other countries that are basically not part of your of your club in our fragmented uh, uh, landscape of, of well countries in the world, um, and yeah, and the, you know, with with the policies that, that that we have, insufficient cooperation and strong industry lobbies at home, and yeah, very narrowly defined mandates. Basically, it's about competition and jobs, and not about well more purpose driven or yeah climate related uh, 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 contributions and then some opportunities is yeah renewable energies and related infrastructure uh, exports are or have shown to be more labor intensive in actually many countries so once the transition is actually uh, working once you get your pipeline your your once you change your the the composition of your of your exports and well get a project pipeline with renewable energy related infrastructure um, exports going then you can actually employ more people that has been shown well for countries like the uk or the netherlands mm. and yeah there's really in this field simply because it's relatively laggard there's there are really genuine climate leadership opportunities and several countries noticed noticed that and that's why they are now uh, yeah, slowly, like getting to actually work on climate proofing, uh, Paris proofing their their uh, their official export finance, and yeah, there are also taxonomies now on okay, what is sustainable finance, and there are some some ideas how to integrate that into um, yeah, for instance, providing better incentives for exporters to uh, yeah as a as a well as an ECA for sustainable exports. So this this could be a lower premium um, that they have to pay to get such ins insurance, um, yeah, or other instruments. And yeah, this is basically it from my side. I hope, uh, yeah. Interesting. Thanks. And now and following the presentation of the board, perfect. <laughs> by our group of students. <laughs> So you wanted to go on the maybe uh, maybe I don't have it open anymore. Okay, guys, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Philip, for, for your presentation. Uh, Felix, Manahil, and me will uh give a, a few comments uh on this um presentation um we'll first try to go in a quick overview of the paper trying not to be repetitive as what philip already said trying to focus in another important aspects that we identify then we will see okay <laughs> yeah okay. okay sorry uh my name is juan jose lopez i'm from el salvador a book student uh, we will then, after reviewing the, the paper, we will see a case of study, as Philip said, we'll focus on Canada, and then we will see uh, some other aspects that we consider important of the context and uh, the framework that we are dealing now uh, in this uh, Paris alignment methodology. So first, uh, briefly, we already saw what's export credit agencies at its uh, logics and dynamics and how they are related to the Paris Agreement. So in this case, we already are identify how these ACAs are really important 
for achieving the Paris Agreement goals because they are related to governments and therefore they are related or they could be related and aligned with the goals that these governments are uh, having. And specifically two cases or two, two aspects that we want to highlight is first that there is a bear of the political mandates and commitments that the specific governments have had, including the Paris Agreement. So in this sense, the ACAs could be, serve as redirecting financial financial flows away from fossil fuels and towards low carbon uh, projects and um, ideas. So this is a potentiality that is really important and is part of the um, spirit that this project that Philip has presented is dealing with. Nevertheless, there are some limitations identified in the paper for the ACAs. As Philip said, there's they have been high, highly criticized for their lack of transparency and how the, the information they are creating is shared or not to other uh, parts of these uh, dynamics. There, uh, second, there's a mission finance through ACAs that are outside national territory that are not part of the green uh, households, gases, accounting, because in this logic, they are still following the territory uh, logic and the territory principle and thus this could be uh, misleading or underestimating the impacts of these greenhouse emissions uh, into the results of the ACAs. And uh, last, there is an existing climate commitment still provide little incentive to decarbonize these, uh, these projects, these finance projects, portfolios, as well as according to experts, there's a lacking speed and ambitions in how they are facing and how they are committing with the police uh, agreement uh, goals. Next one, please. Uh, so, last before. Yeah, no. Next one. Yeah, that. So, uh, briefly, like there's a lack of consensus, like what is Paris alignment exactly? And this is part of the methodology is trying to answer specifically for the ACAs that uh, this paper is trying. And in this commonly is referred to move financial flows towards low GHG emissions and climate relations development. So the paper and this methodology is based on the existing conceptual approaches that they are dealing with Paris Agreement for financial institutions, and they are a set of consensual premises that is proposed that we think is really relevant to consider in general for any methodology, not only for ACAs, that they should uh, be focused on the com uh, comprehensive scope of actions. This means that they should consider direct and indirect support activities in dealing with GHG and also taking into account the entire value of change, not only some parts of this value of change that they are um, considering. And second, they sh should also take long time horizons to guide immediate actions. This means that the carbon lock in effects uh, that are, are illustrated through trade-off should also focus on net zero GHH emissions pathways for their projects. Third, there should also be an ambitious uh, a scale of contributions, both for national and supranational scale of impacts in these projects. In fourth, we also have to take into account the overarching objectives of the Paris Agreement. And in this case, it, this should be focused on aligning these activities specifically with the temperature objectives the Paris Agreement have uh, presented. And last, they all follow the precautionary principle uh, for their activities. So this, this methodology is based on these approaches, based on clearly stated metrics and or indicators uh, for uh, their proposal. Uh, and in general, they also present um, uh, suggestions for any methodology uh, for ACAs in a specific. So they go from the development of clear concept and normative anchoring from the alignment methodology to prioritize the most relevant dimensions of the Paris Agreement. This is uh, for any uh, case of study. Go to define consensus criteria, which is prioritizing uh, prioritize building block. Also to describe the progress on police alignment with clear cut benchmarks. And last but not least, keep it simple and do not distract from the obvious. And I, we think that this is really important in general. And this could be an, an opportunity to consider, for example, going beyond the OECD countries or going beyond to the Nova Globe, uh logic that uh, is mainly uh, used nowadays and could also uh, present challenges and opportunities for global South countries, for example. 
now in general, the ACAs are mostly um, based or they are using the, the composition of their project finance in overseas investment loans or United loans or guarantees. Yeah, and they are uh, by industry, they are mainly uh, focuses on construction and shipbuilding and mining. So as we saw, and we have other uh, information in the next slides, that th these there's still cer uh, certain concentration away from trying to reach these Paris alignment objectives. So this is uh, uh, an important uh, aspect to overcome when trying to align these ACAs with the Paris uh, Agreement. So now, Mana. Um, going over is one of the case studies mentioned already. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm Manahil uh, from Pakistan and I'm major A people. Um, going into detail of the methodology for one of the case studies, um, we will talk about Canada, which uh, has the ECA EDC, Export Development Canada, uh, which is one of the largest supporter of fossil fuel activities in comparison with other G20 ECAs. Uh, we can see here from the pie chart that uh, the amount of money invested in oil and gas is a lot more than renewables. It uh, provided an average of $11 billion per year for oil and gas sector uh, in comparison with $0.5 billion per year which is for the years 2018 to 2020. This was on already an increase from 2016 to 2018 when uh, they did um, $10.6 billion per year. Uh, it was assessed uh, with uh, its alignment to Paris Agreement across five dimensions with the met methodology already explained. Uh, not surprisingly, it was rated unaligned and it had an amazing score of 0 0.47 out of three. Um, to give a more perspective, uh, uh, um, the ratio between fossil fuel support and renewable energy support was 23 to 1 for Canada uh, compared to UK and Germany for which it was 5 to 1 and almost 2 to 1 for Germany. Uh, still, there is a continued domestic fossil fuel support for uh, Canadian fossil fuel value chains, uh, despite various commitments by not only EEDC but also by Canadian government. And no concrete timeline is uh, still given about it, uh, like rescinding the support as of now. Um, talking, uh, going over the dimensions, uh, just an overview. Dimension one talks about financial and non-financial disclosure. It was rated one out of three. Dimension two was, and three were rated 0 0.3, three out of three, and talked about ambition of fossil fuel exclusion and reduction or reduction target for all activities. Uh, dimension five talked about proactiveness of ECAs and their governments, um, which was rated 0 0.67 out of three. Uh, I've left out dimension four because it was uh, amazingly, uh, it scored unaligned in all departments, so I will talk about it in uh, detail in the next slide. Uh, but regarding the recommendations, the paper in the sense is great because it also gives recommendations for all of the problems. Uh, for dimension one, it talks about defining the Canadian clean tech, which is based on uh, lists of specific economic activities, and to disclose this clean tech support um, uh, more transparently. Uh, for the second I mentioned, obviously, uh, the government needs to rescind its support immediately through EDC with uh, freeing up, by, by freeing up resources that can be used for more sustainable activities and also take up complementary policies that can, um, that can support these activities. Uh, for the third dimension, uh, it recommends to track and disclose uh, financed and insured emissions for all new commitments. Uh, so we, they can have a first-hand um, information to make decisions regarding progress, uh, tracking the progress towards GHG, GHG emissions uh, uh, reduction targets. And lastly, for Dimension 5, um, they recommend establishing an advisory council that would not only have leading national and international um, experts, but also to include indigenous people and traditional knowledge holders. Uh, now, to, going into detail for dimension four, it's unaligned for the first and first key question for the second, third, fourth, and fifth. Um, but the recommendations that are given for it uh, include addressing the absence of a common definition for uh, climate finance in global export finance system, uh, and to include clean tech definition in this um, clean tech in this definition on the list of eligible activities. So they can be taken as positive. Uh, and then going beyond common taxonomies of the sustainable finance. Um, moreover, com more comprehensive definition of the clean energy sector overall, 
and to recommend uh, to build renewable energy value chains that are defined. Um, so for renewable energy uh, value chains, they recommend taking Navius research 2019. And for fossil fuel energy sector, they recommend taking the Dutch proposal. And lastly, using incentive mechanisms uh, and price discrimination tools across the entire portfolio uh, to like nudge the customers towards more uh, away from carbon intensive and more uh, towards more sustainable activities. Uh, the next one. Um, overall, for the Canadian government, since it's it's also uh, big on giving support to EDC, there have been recommendations. Is the first one being uh, giving a concrete timeline uh, to imply an immediate phase out of its support, which should have been done by 2022 end, but still has not been done. Uh, moreover, providing specific, uh, moreover, defining the national net zero target, uh, which is already enshrined in the Canadian Climate Accountability Act and uh, already should have imminent implications for corporations such as EDC. Uh, it also talks about creating an, another council, but this one an interministerial steering committee to enhance the public oversight and to, cons uh, like to consolidate the stakes across different departments and ministries. Also talks about adopting necessary complementary policies to diversify the fiscal revenues and scale up public support to uh, more sustainable activities. And lastly, to contribute um, the creation of a new level, new level playing field, uh, such as between US and EU, uh, and to uh, further strengthen the existing coalitions of the willing economies based on, on the consistency with the global 1.5 degrees Celsius objective. Uh, since the waiver talks about COP26, um, we will, I would like to give an update uh, because ever since then, um, a lot, ha uh, a bit more has been done. Uh, so in 2022, E3F summit and COP27 summit were done. Um, and the paper in the presentation mentioned a transparency report, which was published by E3F Collision, which is taken as a win, which it might be a win, of course, but it also fails to mention that E3F host uh, Germany invited a gas industry representative, Mr. Novicki of Lind Engineering, um, to the summit while failing to invite any CSO representatives from Global South, which is majorly uh, the, the area impacted by the projects that are financed by these ECS. Uh, the Global South representation, or um, may I say the lack thereof, seems to have not been stressed enough. And right now it is only taken as domestic economy policy by the Global North. Uh, however, more importance needs to be given to the outreach in regards to Global South countries and them having a say in what are the next important steps to green ECS, uh, as well as international climate. And Felix will talk more. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm Felix, I'm one of the EPOQ students and in the major 2C actually. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the international context we are um, talking about here, um, highly relevant for the international negotiations that Manahil talked about, um, because we're going to talk a little bit about um, what is currently needed in international finance, what is actually being done, and how we are actually working against these trends for fossil fuel finance. Um, first of all, we, when we look at the international climate finance landscape, we immediately see that we are far below target if we want to approach the 1.5 degree target. Um, estimates are currently around um, the value of like 630 billion invested annually into um, climate aligned investments, whereas some investments estimate that we need five to 10 times the amount of annual spending actually um, to reach the 1.5 degree pathway. Um, whereas the global investment gap is quite substantially, some estimates or many actually um, reference two to three percent of GDP that would be needed annually um, to to reach our climate targets. Often that means more in the around two percent for industrialized economies and in developing countries a little bit higher, three percent of GDP. Um, at the same time, while we are lacking in ambition, we continue to rack up climate damages, which will. Um, hurt us substantially in the future. For example, one IPPC estimate points out that we're going to lose all global coral reefs um, if we reach the two degree target, which means that we will not only lose um, the economic foundation of the six million people directly employed in these areas for fishing, um, but also lose the foundation for the 500 million people that currently depend on these ecosystems for food and also for ecosystem services like tourism. Um, next slide, please. 
So at the same time, um, Global North countries have committed themselves to contribute to climate mitigation in the Global South and are considerably failing at um, contributing um, in accordance to the promises. So the Green Climate Fund is a prominent example where rich countries in the Global North have pledged 100 billion each year to be spent in the Global South. Um, and as we can, have, can see also for the last uh, few years, um, these targets have been failed for a long time. Um, furthermore, it's very important to realize that a lot of that, as Philip also mentioned before, is actually just provided in loans to countries in the Global South. Um, and Oxfam, for example, estimates that if we account for the actual value, the additional value that this finance provides, um, that the fund nowadays merely contributes like a quarter of what was initially promised. Um, another interesting example um, for this is the United States, which have promised that they're going to invest up to 11 billion a year, um, starting from next year in global climate finance, but their current spending bills don't account for this value. Currently, they have um, have a spending bill that includes 1 billion, so mere 10% of what they have actually promised the global south to put into investment. And if we look at the comparison of the climate finance that has been provided, um, we see here in this hard to see kind of tune that a very small portion over the year um, has been in export credit agencies. That means that the amount of spending that is being done um, via export credit agencies is not actually reaching even the countries that were considered recipients in this framework. Next slide, please. Um, at the same time, we're actively working against progress in this area. Um, fossil fuel finance in 2021 was still quite substantial with um, more than 700 billion invested every year. Um, if you compare that to the amount of spending that export credit agencies have been providing in the last few years, we can see that it's nearly 20 times as much. So it's a comparison. In comparison, the damage done by export credit agency might not be that big. Um, there are bigger fish to fry in the area of international climate finance. Um, nevertheless, it's an area that definitely needs a lot of attention, um, especially all these points have been discussed previously. I'm going to skip them for now. Um, that we're not supposed to actually develop no uh, new oil and gas fields that we're supposed to leave developed reserves in the ground. Um, and that we have to start to phase out of fossil fuels in the next decade already in the high income countries, whereas low income countries have a little bit more time to reach these goals. So main takeaways um, from this analysis is that clearly we need to tackle the issue of export credit agencies and need to put them on the pathway to Paris alignment. Um, but also that we need much stronger efforts in the area of climate finance in general and that it can be just one element in a more comprehensive framework um, that aims for cost reduction, um, for credit allocation and market making for clean climate tech globally. Um, one of these examples that we considered for such a comprehensive framework and found really interesting because it's very similar in its effect to export credit agencies is the Green um, Impact Fund for Technology, a very interesting proposal that aims to create um, international patent pool that pays out innovators, mostly in countries in the global north, um, for the carbon impact of the technologies in the global south. So a company comes up with a new technology for a very innovative um, solar panel, provides the patent to the fund, um, reduces the cost of the panel because it doesn't need to make the profits from the technology anymore via the open market, and therefore can provide the technology cheaper in the global south. This is kind of comparable to the fact that um, export credit agencies have by reducing the cost of borrowing. Um, so these would be very nice complementary in that sense. Um, at the same time, it's an area that has received very little attention in the past um, and can be highly impactful. For example, in the USA alone, we have 15,000 climate change related patents every year that could be applicable for such a fund. Um, and also wind turbines are a very nice example because two to 8% of their cost normally is associated with royalty fees that could be reduced. Um, so these technologies or these policy options would go very nicely together um, to reduce the cost of technology in the global south. Next slide, please. Ah, yeah, that brings us <laughs> already to a joint problem for both of these policy proposals, um, which is how do we deal with ambivalence? How do we deal with projects that are supposed to be financed that um, are on the face of it damaging to the climate but might pose a net contribution 
Um, and if we deny funding for them, we might end up having higher emissions that we would have had otherwise. Um, so first of all, what is the actual counterfactual for our finance? And if we deny the finance, how can we actually realize that the low carbon option is alternatively realized? A um, very nice example for that is a project in India where the Chinese coal power plant producer um, Harbin produced um, uh, more efficient boilers for them to heat the, the, the water to produce electricity. Patents um, raised the cost of these boilers by more than 1.5 million per boiler, resulting in the older, cheaper technology being the preferable one. Um, so by denying finance, or by in this case from the gift world, um, by increasing the cost of patents, um, we ended up with way higher carbon emissions of 1.5 million tons of CO2 per year per boiler per project initialized. Um, and this would be a very nice example to discuss maybe um, how we could we deal with something like that. Because, for example, your proposal includes um, the recommendation to only allow for climate aligned finance. And in this case, this would not have happened. A project like that that could have saved some CO2, um, even though obviously it would be preferable to use renewable energy. Um, but how do we deal with that? That would be our first question. Um, exactly. And the other part. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, like I mentioned previously, my question would be more about uh, your thoughts on progress on ECA since COP26. What do you think are the necessary next steps to green ECAs and whether or not you, like whether or not it's acknowledged that this is more or less the global north perspective? Because so far, as far as, far as my research, and I feel like a lot of people here would think that that's what I keep talking about, like there's no global south perspective, but that's what it usually is like i don't think there is any global south perspective to the like to the measures or to the recommendations that are given uh, about uh, the next steps forward uh, also we were wondering uh, if should we not also include adaptation finance in a gold standard for ac contributions given the fact that so far they have been mostly uh, focused on mitigation uh, policies but we were wondering also, what about adaptations that are also important nowadays, especially for countries that are already been impacted by uh, climate change? And also, are there what? <laughs> are there other overlooked important areas of climate finance that deserve more attention? Three cases came to our minds. For example, can intellectual property projects by gift fill uh, important gaps? Uh, how can we limit the amount of fossil fuels investment effectively? Because even though we've noticed all these uh, commitments and agreements that countries uh, uh, take, uh, the reality is that, as we show in the data, fossil fuel investment and new projects are still important and still a majority, and they are still getting new and new and new uh, support for several uh, actors. And last, how do we account for economic financial dependency of carbon intense, intensive export goods in carbon accounting schemes? This is related to uh, production-based vis-a-vis uh, consumption-based logic. So this will be our, um, mm, our questions for you, Philip, at the end of your presentation. And thank you very much for uh, this. Thank you. Wonderful, yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot for the presentation and for these uh, for the great questions. Um, let me okay. Let me maybe start with the with the Chinese coal um, example. I'll just go back to the um, to this. Yeah, you know what you framed as ambivalence and indeed i think there's you know uh, yeah a, a lot of ambivalence you know for or trade-offs right for these types of projects because on the one hand on the over the short term you can maybe reduce emissions so there's a relative win right by uh, supporting or investing into the the relatively better technology um, on the other hand you know i think and this is i think really a perspective that we need to uh, yeah, you know, keeps more strongly in mind, like we need to think in absolute terms and, you know, system thinking, planetary boundaries, like what, what can we still afford? How much coal can we still burn? 
and what is you know where will that coal plant stand is it in china is it in a, in a in a you know oecd country um and you know what are the what are the the, the needs and i would say that um, unless there is really a, a situation of um, you know real energy poverty there are no reasons whatsoever anymore today to uh, uh, you know, to use coal to produce uh, electricity um, from a, you know, normative point of view, simply because we would, you know, uh, transgress the, the, well, the, the planetary boundary of having a stable climate system. Um, on the other hand, for instance, also how the, uh, I mean, I gave the example of the reform of the OECD arrangement, right? So they tried to tackle exactly that question by, re by introducing a sector understanding on coal-fired electricity generation, and they introduced a technology standard, which was um, for well different sets of countries on different levels. But I think in the global south, it was like 950 grams of CO2 uh, per kilowatt hour was still permissible. Um, so you know, if if your coal-fired power uh, plant was below that threshold, as an ECA, you were you know allowed to still finance that. And then six years later, they introduced the whole ban on. On, on all coal-fired um, uh, power plants. But, you know, um, the problem with that is that takes so much time. The drafting a sector understanding for coal-fired uh, power plants is a, was a process of years of negotiation, you know, going and drafting it, getting the consensus of all of the participants to actually get it, you know, uh, get it approved. And if we think about the same for oil and gas, that would that would probably take until until you know mid of the next decade, and we simply don't have that time. So there, there need to be more. Uh, there, there, there need there need to be other solutions if the international community wants to you know stay on a on a one point five or at least below two degree pathway. Um, but yeah, I mean there are. I think in the end, it's a, to to respond to the question. It's a um, it's a context dependent question. That you could resolve with you know if there's a real need for that type of energy in a specific context and some of the some some countries like the uk for instance um, uh, they have in their fossil fuel exclusion policy uh, that they committed to they well they committed to to stop funding fossil fuels except in very few circumstances including such uh, as um, uh, yeah uh, really uh, like extreme energy poverty so for instance if you re rebuild a country like Iraq, you know, in such a case, if there is no better alternative and coal would be the only option, then that would still be permissible. So maybe that's uh, uh, that's yeah, that, that's that's an on answer to the question. Um, then the other discussion points. So yeah, progress on ECA since COP twenty, uh, since COP twenty six. Yeah, so since COP twenty six. Yeah, I mean there are several countries that released their policies on how to implement the COP26 statement. Um, uh, uh, yeah, S Spain is one of them, uh, Canada actually, um, uh, and, and, and several others, France, uh, and several did not, Italy didn't do it, Germany didn't do it, they signed the statement, but they didn't release the policy, although they, they, they promised to do that before the end of last year, but they didn't do it. Um, uh, but still, there is progress. Um, there is also there are negotiation rounds on updating uh, the current climate change sector understanding at the OECD. Um, so this is about making it more well, uh, yeah, just making it more uh, fitting for the current environment of renewable energy related exports. So, for instance, to permitting longer um, maturities for loans in 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 yeah, if you if you finance a wind park and less. Um, uh, uh, yeah, less admin time and things like this. So there, there, there are some there are some reforms, and I think that's 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 on a good way. But on the other hand, as I said, like the the big elephant in the room is oil and gas um, financing, and to date there is no there is no government that yeah that is willing to table a proposal on introducing oil and gas restrictions in the OECD arrangement. So I think this is really where we need to make progress. And where it's where where it's still where it's still lacking. There are several countries that you know kind of yeah have good good proposals, good ideas, good st steps into the right dimension. You mentioned the the Dutch, uh, for instance, they developed this methodology how to measure the exposure to fossil fuel value chains in their entirety, and that was a very substantive uh, approach. They commissioned um, yeah and and. 
uh, external experts, they did that. And after that, this was introduced first for the Dutch and then now at the E3F level. Um, and so at least now, uh, yeah, there is this transparency gain, which is not a material gain, right? But at least governments can now be held more accountable and um, uh, yeah, and their progress can be tracked, tracked better. Then other questions. So the yeah, global north versus global south perspectives, I think that's very important because much of the projects um, that happen that are supported by ECAs take place in the global south. And um, uh, yeah, for instance, the LNG project right in Mozambique. And well, actually there is yeah, this perspective is it's, it's especially because the, the negotiations on official export finance take place at the OECD being an organization that only includes, um, well, uh, well, rich countries from the West. Um, uh, this perspective is really uh, not well enough represented. And we even had, uh, I gave the example of this, uh, of the representative from uh, Mozambique, right? So when we, when we were holding the side event at COP26, he was denied his visa to come to the, to the UK. <laughs> He was fighting to get it for four weeks. They, they didn't let him fly. He had to participate virtually. It was ex it, it was an ex it was an app it, and it went up to the up to the um, uh, embassy level that we tried to get them into the UK. But there were some we don't know exactly if there was any kind of background. But he wasn't allowed to enter the the country. And that wasn't that wasn't a very normal uh, process. But you know. Things are uh, critical with that, and I think especially at International Climate Forum, like the COPs, um, yeah, the perspectives of the Global South, of indigenous people, of um, uh, other yeah, deprived groups in the, uh, in the world, this is extremely important and is absolutely absent from most uh, uh, negotiations in expert finance. Then, yeah, why do we don't look, why don't we look at adaptation? I mean, I briefly mentioned it, when we started to work on export finance, it was such a black box. And um, we, we, we basically decided we focus on mitigation because there's so much to do. And um, uh, yeah, any of you are welcome to uh, uh, develop a complement of our methodology to um, also cover adaptation. But let me just tell you that for adaptation, the metrics are much more difficult. Um, there's a lot of uh, debate on yeah how to define good adaptation metrics. What is a good adaptation project? How do you how do you define that? Uh, yeah, how do you also devise uh, financial support for that? So there are a lot of open questions and um, there's, for instance, no taxonomy uh, um, that is really acknowledged. Um, but yeah, it's clearly this is, this is important and I'm sure that also ECAs can through uh, yeah, high technology, like supporting the right exports also contribute to adapting to a, uh, for instance, the sea level rise in cities, the Dutch are great in that, right? So they, I'm sure they, they would have a, a future in exporting that technology um, over the next decades and then helping countries in the South to adapt um, to the impacts of, of sea level rise, while at the same time, I'm sure they can also, this, is, this might also be a profitable sector. Um, so I'm sure there is something to come. Um, yeah, we didn't take it into account because we saw the, the priority given the mitigation targets that are so imminent, um, uh, simply more important than uh, talking about adaptation at this point. And yeah, I think the, you know, gift example, it's, it's, it's a great example of how to enable, uh, yeah, technological um, uh, uh, support uh, or transfer between the North and the South. And yeah, um, maybe you have an, or maybe you could develop an idea how you could link that or also, you know, reducing uh, um, royalty rights in the context of ECA finance. Um, I'm sure that would be, uh, that would be quite, quite an interesting link. And yeah, but yeah, we, we haven't touched upon royalty rights so far in, in our work. Um, and then, yeah, how we can we limit the amount of fossil fuel if investment effectively? So, uh, well, in our experience, what works best is increasing the public pressure on governments, um, because at least if it's about the public side of things, right, on the on public finance, so where governments basically have an agency and a say about, um, and this is this is basically through campaigning, through publication of 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 of, of, of reports, 
going into the media. So we, we also always try to get um, uh, publications in, in media outlets um, because it's, this is also something that is, that is being read that can in increase the pressure on, on governments to actually um, yeah, uh, express a higher ambition on, in, in their policies. So I think if that's effective in the end, uh, probably it will not be enough. So one thing that I uh, already mentioned before is this fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. So I, it, yeah, in, it, I think to really effectively limit the production of fossil fuels globally and within the speed and scope of that is needed, something like this would be necessary this decade and with a, a clear uh, pathway to limiting fossil fuel production. It's, the problem is just that we don't have the right fora for that. Because at the COPs, for instance, we have the principle of unanimity. That means that it's a basically a consensus-based uh, forum. So basically all propositions like this, if you put them on the main table, this will not stay there because uh, fossil fuel producing countries, they uh, lift their hands and um, basically say, well, we don't want to discuss about this. And, and yeah, and, and with that, these proposals in the current institutional setup basically die. That's why side deals are very important. And that's why kind of these coalitions of the willing um, smaller groups of countries that within their uh, realm, within their political sphere, they coordinate and they come to this type of, of conclusions. I think that's the right way forward um, in, the, in, the current, uh, in the current fragmented, um, well, uh, uh, international relationships. And then the last question was, how do we account for economic carbon? Oh, yeah. OK, so this is basically about how to account in ex about export embodied CO2 emissions, right? It's more like there's a problem or, if we account for carbon production base, then we're not going to capture all the consumption based emissions, obviously. And mm -hmm. consumption based, we exclude all the production-based emissions. But the mm -hmm. thing is, if we have consumption-based emissions, for example, for Europe, um, even though we are highly dependent on exporting these carbon-intensive technologies that mm -hmm. are used for fossil fuel extraction, we profit from it, mm -hmm. and we own large part of fossil fuel assets globally, so we benefit economically and financially, mm -hmm. but this is not accounted for in our carbon footprint, in that sense. Yeah. So, and either way, we undercount the actual responsibility in highly industrialized countries. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if there's framework where we can actually make this dependency visible. Mm -hmm. The carbon dependency of the economy, which would be higher than production-based and consumption-based, mm -hmm. would not add up to 100% of the most um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. That's, I think, a very important question because well, we, we know now that only looking at production-based emissions is not enough, and we should take into account consumption-based ones. And I mean, you could probably you know, estimate uh, the emissions that are enabled through uh, the export of a, you know, of a good that does, you know, sure, if you export, for instance, well, say, uh, a pipeline, um, right, or uh, a drilling machine, then, okay, there are emissions that are occurring whilst you produce this at home in Austria or in Germany. And then, but then you could estimate, okay, in the project where this capital good is used, how many emissions will be, uh, oh, you know, what, what are the scope three emissions of the project, you know, that, that you basically deliver this capital good to? I think this, is, this could be actually estimated. Um, and and also you know broken down on the share of of the project component, which in that case would be the let's say the drilling machine, and you could probably um, make an estimate of that. But yeah, in the current GHG accounting system, this is this is not considered, and you can simply export um, machinery equipment that is used in yeah to extract fossil fuels without being held accountable or without having an add up on your on your GHG balance. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I suggest that we give some time for the audience also. Yeah. I'm sure that there are many people. Uh, can I have a microphone? Yeah. Here. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there are many questions. So sorry, I I, uh, I know some of you, but Philippe doesn't. So please introduce yourself every time. I insist on that. Uh, Marla. 
uh, you. So there are how many questions do we have? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, if it's too much, I can split it in two. Okay, so the five questions in a row. Ladies first, Mala. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. Is this on? Well, ah, okay. All right. Um, yes, it was very interesting. My name is Mala. I'm also an EPOC 2 student. Um, and I have a more technical question. So I'm wondering what part of exports is either insured or financed through loans before the actual purchase is happening. So I'm wondering if um, if we talk about exports of, um, for example, climate um, climate harming products or energy, um, is really the majority of those subject to um, the need for this type of finance and then also subject to this, you kind of described it as like an, emergency type of finance to get it from those type of agencies because I could imagine I think it's different for newly developing projects like the one in Mozambique you were mentioning but if we think about already established trade links I assume these are generally quite stable so if you're importing gas from a country that that these payments are coming is relatively sure yeah second question I'm sorry, you already raised the question before, but once again. Well, hi, my name is uh, Joaquin from Uruguay. Thank you very much for your presentation and to my colleagues. Uh, I have um, like a twofold question regarding more the functioning of the consultancy firm, the climate consultancy firm um, that you belong to. I would like to know if you perform any sort of lobbying active lobbying or if you consider to uh in order to counteract what you were mentioning about like the big lobbies oil industry performs and secondly um do you have any way of measuring the impact that your publications your um uh, appearance here today with us and all the other activities that you perform has on tackling the issues that you address Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm Christina, um, studying EPOC um, plus D. <laughs> and uh, I was I have two questions. One is more basic because I still didn't understand how the like methodology works and whether you're uh, trying to assess like a uh, on a country level or on the agency level or on the like project level and then what is kind of your threshold for assigning something as uh like aligned or not aligned whether and because yeah and felix mentioned it earlier like with, with the consumption and production um uh emissions but like when you're assigning let, let's say assessing a country like um do you do you like exclude any fossil based project or do you use these like kind of standards that you said you know like 95 uh, um kilograms uh of uh, emissions per kilowatt hour or how 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 does that exactly work mm -hmm. and um second uh more of a uh like theoretic question for also in link with the global south countries because i feel like um this is the the agencies are kind of a mechanism of uh, unequal exchange uh, per se and kind of like a modern uh, colonialist structure and uh, i can see this happening even like without fossil fuels project you know uh, so for example like lithium mining or any like mi uh, mining of mi minerals uh, and you will still have this like canadian companies coming to, I don't know, like Serbia or Romania or uh, any other country uh, and uh, starting these projects which are very like unequal in terms of the impacts on the local population and uh, of like who's benefiting from the uh, from the operations. And even if they are not producing any emissions, it will still be uh, very problematic. So I want to ask whether you're also like um, giving this some attention. 
So like you're able to, to produce the sentence. Yeah, um, thank you for your presentation. My name is Elizabeth. I'm in Major B from Nigeria. And my question is quite brief. You talked about the opportunities for financing green ECAs. And I think you mentioned that the adoption of renew renewable energy provides job opportunities uh, since renewable energy is more labor intensive, but I'd like you to expand on that logic, the mechanism behind this conclusion, if there's like any empirical evidence for this, uh, because I could imagine that maybe that outcome changes based on context studied. Uh, yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Okay. Last uh, well, thank you for your presentation and thanks for the discussions. Um, my question is more of a question. Uh, I'm Luca Major. E or book two. Um, and my question is more to, to what's a personal opinion from you. Um, following from Christina, also like we have there's multiple evidence on on how there's been over the last hundreds, or like yeah, let's say a hundred years, that the capital accumulation system in the global north has been dependent on cheap resources in the global south and uh, has been based on exploitation of these natural resources. Um, we can see the explosion in China of, of like the, the fossil ex explosion not only happened because of China saying, yes, we're interested in fossil fuels, but also because of the global capital inflow. So there's, you also mentioned these <clears throat> demand changes. Okay, we stop producing fossil fuels, other countries will step in. Mm -hmm. So clearly there's international dependencies. There's, uh, it's much more complex. And then this raises the question of, can markets kind of inhibit or, or work against these, these dependencies um, and or, or does it become political democratic questions and I would like to ask you like where what is your stand on do these clearly they have an impact but are these still in my opinion market-based mechanisms enough to have a meaningful impact in preventing climate change at least in the next 15 years or yeah do we need to I mean end capitalism in a more, I don't know, militant way, whatever, but yeah. So uh, you already have your mic. So you have basically, you have 20 minutes to rebuild the work. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks for these great questions. Um, well, I'll, I'll put your question at the end. So it's, the, it's the biggest one, <laughs> the broadest one, I think. So um, yeah, Mala on the, um, on the, basically uh, on the high risk, right? You were asking about the risk that, that ECAs take. So yeah, and, and about this kind of insurer of last resort and how much exports they actually insure. So that, that really depends on the, on the country. So there, there are some countries that have <clears throat> a relatively very strong official export support, like Canada, for instance. It depends on how you measure it, but you could like look at it on a per capita basis or like against GDP. I don't know the I don't know the exact numbers now, but in in Canada that was very significant, and in the U.S. for instance, it's the the ECA that the U.S. has is compared to their economy and to their exports relatively uh, small in in in, the, in its in, in its importance. Um, so, but you can find that in the studies that we wrote, we we tried to you know somehow understand the the significance of 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 these ECAs in uh, yeah in. Uh, in the in, in the countries that we looked at, and um, so, but what is a like what is a effect is that ECAs, you know, they're basically they come in if there is just a high risk um, to uh, yeah for 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 exporters to take a certain transaction, um, or also for banks that are also customers sometimes if they want to reduce the cost of borrowing, um, and that's you know, and as you already anticipated, more often the case in a greenfield uh, project like in Mozambique when you open a new project than in an already existing one. So I think the tendency is, is, is certainly there. Um, but that, yeah, it always depends on the, on, on the context and, and a bit on the country. But I, I hope that this more or less answers your question. And yeah, we, we thought about this and we even found or calculated, estimated some numbers about the, about the relative importance of, of export finance in a, in a certain country. Um, then yeah, Joaquin on the function of perspectives, right, of us as a as a research uh, firm. So if we do active lobbying, yes, no. Um, I would say yes and no, <laughs> because uh, for you know real lobbying, there are lobbying organizations that exactly do that. You know, um, expressly stated, there are you know campaigning organizations. There are our partners. 
This is Oil Change International, for instance, that's Friends of the Earth, um, Oxfam, uh, in Germany, Urgewalt, um, in Italy, Recommen, in yeah, Friends of the Earth, France. So, so there are many, um, you know, active lobbying organizations that, that do exactly that. They campaign and they um, also write reports, but they're basically NGOs and they campaign. And what the role of perspectives is in that, or what how we understand our role is more um, to uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, we also provide publications, but they're more research-based. Um, so we try to go much more into detail and we try to, you know, come up with this systematic assessment um, uh, that, you know, takes really a kind of a, a, a look at the most important actors and countries, whereas NGOs, in most of the cases, they, you know, they basically, uh, so there's an, you know, we come and they look on Italy or Urgewalt, they often, they mostly, you know, campaign on the German ECA. So, so there was this global perspective was kind of missing. So we, we filled in that gap and, and try to, you know, be more objective with our methodology and with this kind of scoring approach that actually, I mean, it's a bit artificial, but it actually works quite well because countries and governments start asking, oh, how much does the UK score? Or why do we get that score here and not this one? So it, this is like this peer effect is actually working, which uh, we, it, when we devised it, we, we had no idea, but it's actually, so that there are some effects and, um, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's maybe also about the impact of the publications. I mean, you know, <laughs> we publish something, we lay out it ourselves, and then, um, but we, yeah, we, we basically spoke to almost all governments of the countries we, we analyzed, except Japan, and we have like a, a really a, a growing network. And I mean, they know that they are not in line with Paris, right, with their ECAs. It's not a secret. It's just that before no one has done a publication on it and kind of showed it, right, stated it. And so, I mean, in at least the media was normally quite interested. Like in uh, in Canada, CBC called us. In the US, we got a we got a, a few newspaper publications. And then these publications are basically used by the campaigning organizations in their campaigns. Right? They say, okay, there's a, a, a research firm from Germany. They find that uh, Exim EDC is not in line with the Paris Agreement. And then these resources, you know, they can be used in a, in, in campaigning strategies. So, you know, we are complicit, but we're not, let's say, the, 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 the lobbying organization ourselves. And we want to keep a bit this neutral stance and rather organize dialogues like at the OECD or somewhere else. Um, and then, yeah, on the methodology. Yeah, I mean, if you want to understand like 100% how it works, I would recommend the methodology document. But so in brief, what, what we look at is the, so the ECA portfolio, that's the assessment boundary, ECA portfolio and government policy. Mm -hmm. So whenever a government basically uh, states a policy for the ECA, like at the COP26 statement, um, or, you know, when, for instance, the finance minister says they want, that they now have the ambition to align with 1.5 degrees and propose this and this and this for their ECA. You know, that was something that we analyze. So the content of such commitments, um, because this is something, if it's written and published, this is something that you can actually hold accountable against the government. Uh, so this is, yeah, this, this goes in and then, yeah, then the ECA. So this is, it's ECA and government. That's the assessment boundary. And um, yeah, and then we basically, you know, for each of the, in each dimension, for each of the sub questions, we have four benchmark categories underlined, uh, some progress, Paris aligned, and transformational. So if an ECA scores, you know, transformational, then get, they get three points in that subcategory. And then this three points is multiplied with the weight and then basically adds up to the final score. Yeah. Um, and whether we look at standards or a priori exclusions, so that depends a bit on the on the context and the project, but so if if they would use if they would adopt really good and stringent standards, we would probably give them some progress. Uh, and if they have an uh, a priori exclusion policy like the like the UK, we would give them either like depending on the exceptions, we would give them either Paris aligned or transformational, because we need to get to an a priori exclusion for for public finance institutions. Like definitely, there's there's no way around it to to get private finance to move as well. So they need to move move first, and they they need to move fast. Um, so yeah, and then 
on the question of yeah mechanism of unequal exchange um, without fossil fuel projects yeah absolutely the case i mean we uh, i mean there are many problems even with renewable energies right like it's they are very you know rare earths that you need there's a, a big resource question big land question as well there are many unresolved problems and um yeah there, there are there, there may even be you know big unintended side effects if every country propped up their renewable energy industry at home right um which is something that we recommend but in a way that's not that's not the a healthy way forward because not every country can produce or maybe it doesn't make sense that every country to do produces uh, solar pv and wind power and there needs to be some that actually produce that and will help others so there needs to be more i think cooperation and democratic control in what we want actually to produce and for what aim and i think like leaving it to the market and to this okay like uh priority of being competitive um and of like winning over other countries and the export industries of other countries which was like the development model of um yeah of most industrialized economies today right a state-led um export-led growth expansion um and i mean ecas were at the forefront of of yeah uh, propping up industries at home infant industries um and then bringing technologies that are right for the market um out there uh, and i mean they, they were a part of that but there's uh there are also other organizations but I mean, you know, there are many, many problems, unfortunately, and it's I think there are systemic problems with competition and with this whole system. Uh, and I mean, you know, we work on Paris alignment, so we only work on climate, we don't even work on sustainability, we only focus on climate, like, very narrow, but we, we needed to narrow it down. And, you know, we have some like tangible recommendations and conclusions. Um, but there is a lot, yeah, a lot more to change. But in a nutshell, I think it's about more democratic control and about bringing uh, um, uh, bringing this issue to uh, yeah to parliaments and to devise new mandates for for ECAs because that's whereupon they will act in the end and what they have to uh, yeah be held accountable to. Um, and then yeah, Elizabeth, regarding your question on the empirical evidence, so well I was referring to two studies. Um, that uh, yeah, basically provided empirical evidence for that they used the input-output input model. Um, the one is by Vivid Economics for the UK. They showed that in the UK context, and the other one is by Cambridge Econometrics. They uh, did the same study, which we helped with a bit for the Netherlands. Um, I mean, check those. I'm sure this is not let's say a valid claim for all countries, especially if all countries would be doing that. <laughs> but um, yeah, this this is what we rely on. And I mean, in a sense, you know, there is, I mean, it's it's intuitive. It's like it's it's a more decentralized technology, right? Uh, there's it's it's less capital intensive. So renewable energy, uh, well, the utilities, but also the production um is is more labor intensive than 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 for fossil fuels. And then yeah, and then the the last question. Um Big question on my on my personal opinion how we how we deal with this uh, this is a, a very yeah, a very good one well I think we need um, we need uh, you know more systemic change we need to uh, uh, yeah bring that to parliaments redefine mandates of ECAs and well in in that specific sector come from just yeah bit farewell to this idea and even ideal of competition and competitiveness as a as a as a as a direct policy objective and really go to a more purpose driven um you know equal exchange model between the global south and the global north and i mean the market is the market as it's currently it's not fit for purpose at all for this but i think the good news is that i mean in as much as ecas and thereby governments were able to devise this export let development i think by the same token i think they would be actually capable of devising a more cooperative model that yeah um is in the well goes into takes into account all these well fit for purpose ideas of okay what do we need to exchange who needs what which technologies to support and world and um yeah and 
yeah, and, and I mean, driving innovation, there are also other means than only um, uh, uh, competitiveness. So I think I think there are there are ways and means to um, to to change the system. It's just it's it's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Okay. So I guess I hope nobody is frustrated. So uh, if there are some remaining questions, I know the day has been long. <laughs> Some of you have some some remaining questions. And, uh, no, I see no hand. So before we thank you, I just wanted to let you know that from today on, uh, when you have classes in Condorcet, you need an identity card and plus your student card. Don't forget them. I, I don't know where, why they have decided that, but they have decided that yesterday. <laughs> okay, it's meant to be temporary, but you never. Know. <laughs> okay, so now we can thank and thanks. Thanks for that.